go over some more stuff on support vector machines. Um, so, uh, the, um, um, there is an assignment for, uh, that's going to be, I, I, I wanted to have it posted before today's meeting, but it's not quite ready yet, uh, but it'll be up. Uh, it's almost ready, so I hope, hopefully I'll have it up by today. I'm still planning on having that due, like, next week. Um, so, so yeah, I'm going to talk maybe some specifics about that, though, and uh, just continue on with the support vector machine stuff that we were talking about last time. So, um, I, I, I guess I could jump into it, unless you want to direct me for anything specific. Um, so, let's see. Da, da, da. Um, we we did, we started on these last time. I was mostly I just remind remind you that um, there is um, some. Um, Lecture notebooks that I recommended last time. People, uh, especially for the support vector machine, if you haven't looked at uh, Dr. Ng's uh, lectures, so one of these notebooks under the Dr. Ng's class lectures um, is, is really just kind of pointers to um, his uh, uh, class that he'd done a while ago. But uh, he does a pretty, particularly good job if, you're, if you want to get a better intuition about the mathematics. Um, uh, he has some good stuff in there. So. I tried to do a little bit of that last time, uh, but um, but he definitely goes into more detail about uh, the modifications to the uh, cost function that we use for support vector machines, um, uh, especially uh, how we change this to um, uh, using a, uh, a slightly different uh, rectified linear uh, version of of our uh, function and, and how that changes uh, the uh, the decision boundary that ends up being the best one in terms of the cost function when you do a support vector machine. So, um, anyway, yeah, we kind of talked a little bit about that stuff on Tuesday. Um, I wanted to mention again um, uh, so going over this assignment uh, for it's going to be still due next week. Uh, there is a little bit of stuff about doing some things with kernels, so uh, that was kind of where we ended up last time. Um, um, so uh, one of the parts on the assignment four is to actually build the uh, the Gaussian kernel function in order to uh, do something similar to what we show in here, but but in order to calculate the similarity. Um, and then we actually use that to, um, instead of using one of the built-in kernels for a support vector machine, we use the function that you create an assignment for um, as like a hand-built kernel. So, <coughs> um, So, uh, so I don't know if it would be useful to kind of uh, uh, review um, something about this, but um, uh, let me just mention again on that, since, since we are using these on the assignment, uh, that the, um, um, the, the stuff, the way that support vector machines use kernels uh, it's, it's pretty similar to what we learned when we did the uh, uh, the polynomial features uh, for like the previous assignment where we did polynomial regression, right? So when we did polynomial regression last uh, the, for assignment three, we basically used a pipeline that would take an original single feature and then create like the x x squared and x cubed and higher level. Uh, versions, higher level powers of our one feature that we had in that assignment, right? So that, that was how we did polynomial regression. And the result of that, though, just using the same regression cost function, um, is you get a nonlinear fit um, using the polynomial features, right? So uh, the, the more, the higher the polynomial was, the more wiggly of a, of a, of a fit that you could get uh, doing that, right? 
so really the way that I think about using kernels um, um, as they're used in support vector machines is we're really doing the same thing. So you can think of the, the generic, um, um, and yeah, this comes directly from Dr. Ring's uh, lecture video here if you haven't watched this. But, uh, you know, so we can think of like creating these, uh, the, these new features from the original X1 um, just as, as combinations and higher powers. Um, but then, you know, so some function one, some function two, some function three, and so on, right? Uh, where, you know, like function four was just the, the square of the, the first feature, things like that. Um, so when we do kernels, we do pretty much the same thing. So we take an initial feature or, so, you know, we're, we're doing classification on assignment four. So we're doing support vector machines in order to build a binary classifier instead of a regression problem. So we'll have data sets like this on assignment four where we have uh, two features. So, so to make it easy to visualize, we'll always just use two features for assignment four. Um, and um, we'll have some um, values that are in class zero or the no class and some, some values that are labeled for class one. We want to build a decision boundary. Um, so the, the, the basic support vector machine uses a cost function uh, that's pretty similar to the regression cost function that we talked about. So it, uh, so it really can only create like a linear decision boundary. Uh, and that won't work well uh, for lots of data sets. So, so like a data set like this, there's no good line you can draw on that that will give you really good performance. So you really have to, to create a nonlinear decision boundary. And that's where kernels come in. And we could do exactly the same thing. And in fact, um, I think in this notebook, if you read uh, Dr. Ng's notebook at the bottom here, we do exactly the same thing that we did for regression. So you could by hand uh, force a nonlinear decision boundary by generating the polynomial features uh, and then fitting a support vector machine cost function with those. Um, and in fact, uh, let me jump down to that because we didn't do that uh, last time on Tuesday. Uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, if we have like a data set like this here that we just generated, made up using this function, this moon function, uh, uh, this make moons function from scikit learn will generate data sets that have these kind of curves. Uh, the, the important thing being that, you know, it, again, there's, there's, these aren't linearly separable, so something that's creating a linear model, uh, a linear classification model, won't be able to do well with the, uh, the, the, the moon's data set as is shown here. Did I freeze up? Just a second. Um, Well, anyway, I don't know what happened to that, but I'll just not use that today. Um, so let's go back. So, um, um, so what I was showing uh, here is uh, you can actually use um, a linear. So uh, from from Scikit Learn, um, if you just want to use a linear kernel. Uh, you can either use um, SVC and say use a linear kernel. So um, uh, this, this is uh, relevant to assignment four here once I get it posted. So for example, um, here for assignment four, you should probably always just be using SVC but, um, uh, and specifying the kernel. So for the first part for assignment four, I do want you to, to fit a linear support vector machine uh, using a linear kernel. Um, but so you can do that with SVC by just saying uh, by, by by asking for a linear kernel there, and that will fit the uh, a default. Um, uh, you know, it'll make a, a linear decision uh, boundary if you do that, right? Um, or um, or alternatively. Um, uh, 
uh, like we show here, you can just use uh, linear SVC. So I, I think that that doesn't do anything more than, so you don't have the option to specify the kernel, It'll just always use the linear kernel. But otherwise, that's equivalent to using the SVC, the support vector classifier, where you ask for a linear kernel. So in fact, I probably should have, let me see if I can just uh, uh, get the same results here. If we just do SVC, because this is kind of the way I ask you to do it in assignment four here. Um, Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, so they, these should be equivalent here. Uh, but uh, uh, let me go ahead and try and rerun this here. But notice, so getting back to the point I started making is we're just going to use uh, a support vector classifier with a linear kernel. But like we did for assignment three, uh, um, uh, we're showing using a pipeline where we first um, calculate all of the degree two combination, uh, sorry, degree three, so we're using up to degree three here uh, in this example. So even though we're using a linear kernel, since, since we're passing in uh, uh, higher uh, degrees uh, of, of our features, uh, we will actually get a nonlinear decision boundary uh, in this case, the same way we got a nonlinear regression line uh, for your assignment three here. So let me see if this works here. Uh, so here with our Moon's data set, oops, something died. load the pipeline here. Hopefully I got everything loaded we need. Let's try it again. Uh, right. So there are some differences, uh, da, 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 I guess, between the linear. So linear SVC allows you to do some slightly different things. So let's just try it with the SVC where we, uh, where we use a linear kernel um, on the Moon's database, uh, on the Moon's uh, data that we uh, made up here. Uh, but we're going to pass in the polynomial uh, uh, features up to the third degree combinations here. So we, we do have two sets of data, um, uh, sorry, two features, just feature one and feature two here. So uh, we're doing the same kind of thing on assignment four. So all, all of the, uh, the, the questions you're asked on assignment four, you'll, you'll be given a set of data with two features. Uh, and I do ask, ask you to visualize stuff, so um, you will need to, uh, you can use the, the same uh, trick that we do here. Uh, maybe I'll, and I'll, I'll discuss that now here since I'm thinking about it, since I asked you to do this a couple of times here. But um, uh, back to this, so notice uh, without these polynomial features, uh, you can only fit a line using a linear kernel. Um, but but uh, if we do the same thing like we did for assignment three, um, uh, it will, using the standard cost function for support vector machine, uh, you will get a nonlinear decision boundary. It actually works pretty well here. 
um, uh, for this moon's data. Um, so it looks like it's probably going to uh, generalize pretty well just looking at it visually. Um, yeah, just as a quick example, if, if we hadn't had the polynomial features in our pipeline, um, uh, we would get just uh, a linear uh, decision boundary uh, using the uh, using a linear kernel there. So, um, all right. And then, since I asked you to do this a couple times, on I'm going to ask you on the assignment. Uh, let me just uh, uh, um, um, mention a few things about the code right here where we plot this out. So when you have a nonlinear decision boundary, you can't do something simple. I, I do also ask you to <coughs> get the slope and the intercept and just plot the line. So for the first part for assignment four, uh, you should by hand pull out the, the, the slope, uh, the, the intercept and the, 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 the coefficients uh, and plot the linear decision boundary. But when you have a nonlinear decision boundary uh, using like a radial basis function kernel, or like we did here, uh, creating the, the, the higher level polynomial features, um, a fairly easy trick to do is to, to use a contour plot to plot the thing. So all we're doing, uh, I, 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 I think I have discussed this before, but we're, we're basically, the, the way these contours work is we create a grid of points uh, so in this case, we figure out what the min and the max are for the feature one. So it ranges something like from negative two to three, and what the min and the max are for the feature two, uh, or feature zero and one, if you want to use the indexes here. Um, and you know, so it ranges; it has a slightly different range from negative one point five to two here. Um, and uh, from that, you know, you can pretty much use this as boilerplate. But this mesh grid function will create a bunch of different, uh, uh, you know, combinations. So in this case, since we have, um, um, uh, we're using a step size of 0 0.02 in this example. So that means uh, every, uh, our grid, uh, every 0 0.02 from, you know, from negative 2 to 3 and every 0 0.02 from, from negative 1.5 to 2 is covered uh, on the grid here. So the result of that is um, um, the trick here. So we've trained, we fit a, a, a support vector machine classifier um, on our data set, um, and then we ask it to predict over all of these grid values, um, uh, doing using the xx and the yy here. Right. So this gives us z. So you can think of this as the z as the a, a third dimension. So, but but basically. Um, uh, for the contour plot, um, um, everything that ends up being, you know, predicted on the the negative class, so everything that's below zero, uh, or actually below zero point five, since we're probably using the standard um, threshold for this data. So um, uh, the result on this contour plot is, is it's going to just give dif different colors for the things that are below 0 0.5 and above 0 0.5 um, on the, the default, uh, at least the way that we show it here. So the result is you can, you can see exactly where the decision boundary ends up being for the fitted model uh, using this kind of this trick um, on the contour plot here. Um, hopefully that makes sense, but um, that's, uh, I do ask you to do this a couple of times on the assignment four, so, so you can do something similar. You might have to modify uh, this kind of code um, depending on uh, uh, what we're doing, but uh, but you should be able to see nonlinear decision boundaries using a contour plot like this. Um, Oh, uh, and by the way, so back to talking about kernels. So um, we're, we're not going to be using like a polynomial kernel for assignment four, uh, but uh, there are, uh, I think I shared this on Tuesday, um, besides the linear kernel, um, there's a couple of nonlinear kernels. So most people use the RBF, the radial basis function kernel, 
which is basically the Gaussian kernel, um, um, like I discussed last time. But there are a couple of different ones, so in including there is a, a, a built-in polynomial kernel, which I believe is pretty much doing the same thing like we just did by hand. So it creates the, uh, the, the um, uh, combinations of higher degrees of your uh, features for whatever degree you specify. And so if you use a polynomial kernel, you can specify the degree uh, in SVC. So it will use that uh, when creating the different polynomial features. Um, So in this case, yeah, we were using a C of 10. Um, so the, that should be the same C here. Uh, but the C0, the, the coefficient 0, I can't remember. That's, an, that's another parameter for a polynomial kernel, uh, if I remember right. So it's, let me look at the documentation real quickly here uh, for the coefficient 0. So yeah, it doesn't really tell you very much. Independent term in the the for uh, for polynomial and sigmoid uh, kernels there. But yeah, I can't remember what the coefficient zero does. But anyway, um, if we use a C of ten, we should get something pretty close to what we just did here when we did it by hand, uh, generating the polynomial features. Yeah, so it does look quite. It does look a bit different though. So uh, we'd have to play around maybe with that coefficient zero or some other stuff um, uh, to check it out. But um, um, anyway, so. Um, uh, to finish up on this notebook, um, uh, there is an example then, the last one, uh, of using the actual uh, radio basis function kernel. Um, so that's kind of the, the last thing that you do on the assignment four once I get it posted. Um, oh, and, and also, um, uh, I do ask you to use uh, standard scalar, so there's examples of doing that here at the end of this notebook as well. Uh, that, that's kind of, uh, I don't think I talked about that on Tuesday, but the support vector machines can be, uh, they're one of those types of algorithms that can be very sensitive to when the uh, features are of different scales. So, uh, so yeah, if, if you, if you want to use support vector machines, you probably should always be scaling your data. Um, 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 so in, in this case, for the moon's data, it wasn't very different scale, like negative 1.5 to 2. So it had a range, a total range of about 3.5 versus negative 2 to 3, so 5, but, but it was a little bit of, of, of a different scale. So it, but if your scales are vastly different, um, support vector machine will tend to uh, not do very well uh, if you're not doing some scaling uh, on your features before you uh, fit your models. So. so you should be doing that for assignment 4. Um, and um, we talked a little bit about the C parameter last time. Um, um, let me just, um, uh, since you do have to play around with that on assignment four, let me just uh, 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 review that uh, a bit as well. Um, so, So uh, uh, here, just to review what we talked about last time, um, for like logistic regression support vector machine, uh, historically uh, the, the cost function was specified like this. So if you remember back for the linear regression, we, when we added in regularization, we added in this plus, and we added in the sum of either the squares or the absolute values to get L1 or L2 uh, regularization. But we had this lambda parameter before, right? And, and so if lambda is zero, you have no regularization. And if you made that really big, you'd be emphasizing uh, having more regularization, so more of a penalty term. 
which tended to try to drive down the size of the theta parameters that you fit. Right? So uh, if, if you look at support vector machines, and actually if you look at logistic regression as well, it doesn't have lambda, but you can specify a C. Uh, but it works the same as um, the, the lambda that we talked about when we were talking about regression, linear regression. It's just that the C parameter is multiplied times the, uh, uh, the part of the cost function where we're fitting uh, the theta instead of the, the penalty term. So that means that um, um, as I thought that we mentioned here uh, somewhere that, that basically uh, C and lambda are the um, inverse of each other. So in fact, you should get pretty similar results if you, like if I wanted to use uh, a lambda of, um, you know, two or three, if, if you just do one over two or one over three, it's not exactly equivalent, but it, it's close. Um, um, uh, if I wanted to compare something that was just lambda to something that was just C here. So, uh, but, but yeah, for the assignment, uh, you do have to use different uh, values of C in order to control the amount of regularization. Um, and and uh, I'll jump down here, but uh, we show that on the examples at the bottom of this uh, Dr. Ng's uh, lecture uh, notebook in here. But also besides that, um, I didn't mention this last time when I was talking about um, uh, the, the kernel function. Uh, we, we discussed the kernel function and we talked about the sigma parameter. Um, uh, and sigma uh, controls the uh, kind of the, the shape of the similarity function for the Gaussian kernel or the radio, radio basis function kernels, right? So the bigger sigma is kind of the wider uh, the similarity curve will be, and, and then the, the smaller this is, the more pointed or focused it will be. Um, so, jumping down to this one, um, you'll find that there's no thing specified as sigma. So if you're using a radio basis function, you can modify that, that the, the shape, uh, you know, how spread out your similarity function is for the radio basis function kernel, but there's no sigma parameter. Instead, there's a gamma parameter. Um, So, um, so oh, I mean, back to, you know, first, uh, so I mentioned the C. So there is the C parameter so that you can use that to control the amount of regularization, uh, but it will be the inverse of the lambda. So uh, before, uh, you know, uh, for linear regression, uh, if we wanted to have a lot of regression, we would make lambda high. So since C is kind of the inverse, if we want to have a lot of regression, we need small values of C, uh, and vice versa. So if, if we, we want to minimize or not have as much regularization, you want to use bigger values of C um, uh, for the assignment and for these examples here. But, but anyway, so that's, that's what the C parameter does for the, the support vector machines and also for logistic regression. Um, but you can also specify, if you're using like a radio basis function, you can also specify the gamma here. Um, it's actually used for RBF and poly and sigmoid um, um, kernels. So, um, Um, oh, yeah, shoot, so uh, the, 
this is discussed in the assignment, but, but again, there's, a, there's an easy relationship between gamma uh, and sigma. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I can't remember the relationship, but I, did, I do have that in the assignment four. So, I mean, basically, uh, you can convert uh, uh, between the gamma and the sigma. Um, so, so we talked about it as, as a sigma parameter for these radial basis functions, but you can calculate the, the corresponding gamma um, uh, if you have that. Uh, and that is in the lecture note, but I'll talk about that maybe next week as well. I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't put that in this notebook here um, so we could show it. But, but the, the effect, if you look through this example here, um, since we're specifying a gamma, we're, we're specifying both C and gamma. So we discussed this a little bit on Tuesday. So both of those will have an effect on the amount of uh, regularization that you're dealing if you're using support vector uh, uh, classifiers. Um, so for, for C, uh, sorry, our invention, so C it has the inverse relationship to, to uh, to the, uh, the, the lambda. So um, uh, when you have big values of C, that's like having small values of lambda. Um, so that's when you want to de-emphasize regularization. Um, you're not having a problem with overfitting. But when you're having a problem with overfitting, you want to use smaller values of, of C. Likewise, for gamma, uh, you know, this is discussed a little bit in this notebook. Um, I'll go back to this figure here. So if that's really wide, so, so we called it sigma in this notebook, but so if, if sigma is a large value, that'll be wider, so that will tend to smooth things out. Uh, so that'll be more like uh, having a lot of regularization, right? So that's another thing that you can play with, having a large sigma, uh, making that larger, uh, have, have, having a larger uh, function for calculating similarity. Um, um, that will tend to be like like using a lot of regularization, so so making your functions smoother. Um, whereas uh, you know if, if you're not having a problem with overfitting, um, um, if, if you're underfitting the other way, um, in this case you'd want sigmas to be smaller, more focused, so that you're only getting um, um, similarities when you're really close to one of the landmarks, like we talked about. So, anyway, so back to this here uh, for assignment four. Um, I do ask you to do some stuff like this as well, uh, where you use a radial basis function um, and change C and, and or gamma or both uh, at the same time. So similar stuff like is shown at the bottom of this uh, lecture notebooks here. Um, and um, let's see. So, for example, in this case, we're using a really small value. See, let's just vary C. That's usually easier to understand. So uh, a, a very small value of C is it's like having a large value of the lambda for our um, regularization. Um, so this should be pushing the model to be more linear uh, when you're using really small values of C in this case, right? Um, so we get something like this. So if we get even smaller, let's see. Um, so essentially zero. Uh, yeah, because of the way it works, you'll only ever get things like this. But, um, but, but yeah, so we're not using a lot of regularization like this. Where if you go in the other direction, so if you make big values to C, you'll be more emphasizing uh, the, the part of the cost function that's fitting the, the theta parameters. So uh, let's try, I don't know, like 100 or something.
Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that not ended up being a real great example, so it doesn't look like a whole lot different. But, but yeah, that will have um, some effects um, um, on um, the, uh, uh, the shape of the decision boundary that's made, um, depending on your data set and other stuff that you have. So, uh, but, yeah, we do, you'll, you'll get a better example of that in the assignment four. So we do ask you to uh, find some different values of this in order to uh, vary um, the decision boundary that you end up uh, 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 finding for different data sets. Uh, let me see here, just real quickly, if I can't remember if varying, if, if varying the gamma will have much of an effect either um, for this Moon's data set here. So let's go to C of 1, but try... Um, So uh, gamma is also kind of the inverse of sigma. So um, uh, having small gamma should be like big sigmas and vice versa. So um, uh, yeah, well, there, okay, there was an uh, effect. So so that has a bigger effect than uh, um, than C does in this case for this data. I'm a little bit surprised by that. So so yeah, it is a very small one. This is like having a very big Sigma, so we essentially um, um, uh, have so much penalty, we force it back to like a linear decision boundary uh, in this case. That was kind of what I was trying to do with the C. Um, whereas if we try a bigger one, well, we already saw something that was um, um, allowed it to have a uh, so when C is, is larger, uh, we're going to get kind of a nice uh, drawing around um, the, uh, uh, the one class, uh, in this case, that's found by the, by the fit there. Okay, so that was just a couple things uh, finishing up on this. So I wanted to jump over to the other, so there are two uh, lecture notebooks uh, that you can go through. The other one is more directly from the readings uh, for, from the hands-on machine learning, but I thought I'd go through this one a little bit. Um, um, although we will be uh, 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 covering some of the same stuff that we talked about uh, with the previous notebook uh, on Tuesday. So Um, so here, uh, let's go back to like we did on Tuesday. Uh, so think about the simplest case. So um, um, uh, we're, we're mostly going to concentrate on classification here. Um, uh, so we'll start with binary classification. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, use the IRIS data set as an example this time. Um, so for this one, uh, yeah, and, and just to use two of the three classes we have in the iris. Um, so this data is clearly linearly separable, but like we talked about uh, on Tuesday, you know, um, uh, 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 there's going to be there's still going to be an infinite number of, of lines, an infinite number of ways that you can separate these. Um, so the default logistic regression will give you something uh, that's reasonable. Um, so neither of these look like would be very good, right? So given these data sets, you'd expect you'd want something like this because, you know, you see data here, but, you know, there, there could be some stuff up here uh, making red not very good or some stuff up uh, over here um, uh, in typical data sets making the red not very good, vice versa. You know, so these are coming, both of these are kind of coming close to one or the other values in there, right? Um, so instead, you know, a good one would seem to be something more like, uh, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the solid line here. Uh, and this is what the support vector machine with a reasonable C will give you. Is it will try to find something that gives you the, the largest margin. Uh, we'll try to maximize the amount of space between the closest value uh, and the decision boundaries that you have here. If the data, you know, so again, we're, we're concentrating on the uh, idea where uh, the data is 
absolutely linearly separable, right? So this should kind of make intuitive sense to you. Um, um, we could, if it's linearly separable, there's lots of lines we could draw that would separate them, but uh, uh, looking at this, there are uh, some intuition about what would probably be a good decision boundary uh, given uh, the data that we have. Um, So, um, uh, I, I didn't bring up these terms on Tuesday. Uh, our, our textbook, if you did the readings, um, uh, uh, defines these ideas of soft margin versus hard margin classification. So, um, like we talked about on Tuesday, um, if the data is uh, linearly separable, um, then, you know, we can kind of use our intuition of maximizing that that margin, um, um, uh, making it as large as possible, uh, should give us a you know a, a a good decision boundary. But when when the data is not linearly separable, um, we can still use support vector machine uh, to, to find a decision boundary for our uh, binary classification. Um, um, and that's where varying the C parameter does, right? So, so support vector machine works best if we do have regularization in the term there. Um, and uh, if the data is not linearly separable, we will want to have the C uh, be kind of smallish so that we uh, allow it to ignore some points, uh, not take them into account or uh, minimize their effect. Uh, and still try to find a good decision boundary even if some points are in or in the margin or on the wrong side of the decision boundary. Um, and that's really kind of what's being gotten at when we talk about hard margin versus soft margin. Um, so by making C um, So it, 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 to me, it's a little bit reverse of what I would think would be intuitive. Uh, so I, you know, I like using lambda better. But but um, uh, if you have smaller values of c, uh, that will try to force it to use as large of a margin as you can, um, and um, that may or may not give you good results though in terms of generalizing, right? So it's, uh, you know this. Uh, Another way of thinking about that is larger, uh, smaller values of C will make it more um, sensitive to outliers. Um, and hopefully we have an example of that here coming up. But um, um, so, whereas if you use larger values of C, you'll be getting more of what I think of as regularization. So that will tend to loosen up uh, the requirement to keep stuff out of the margins or as far away, or to even allow more stuff to be on the wrong side and not affect the cost too much of, of, of the decision boundary. So, um, So let's see here. So I think these were just meant to be, again, examples of using from scikit-learn. Um, so there's a little bit of discussion here and in the textbook about you know um, uh, the different things you can use to, to create support vector uh, machine models, support vector machine classifiers. Um, so there's SVC, uh, and then there's specifically the linear SVC. Um, uh, which is basically uh, the SVC using a linear kernel, as far as that's the way I usually think of it. So, uh,
So, um, here, um, um, there's another example of a function in this notebook that does something a little bit more sophisticated, although it is using um, um, uh, kind of the contour plot trick. So we're still doing a kind of a contour plot to figure out the decision boundary on this function here. Uh, but it is also possible to uh, pull out uh, the the uh, the margins uh, for from uh, a fitted uh, support classifier. So if you're interested, uh, we're doing that uh, in this function here in this uh, other notebook. Uh, in particular, um, so up here we're doing the, the stuff the, the stuff we've done before to uh, uh, um, create a contour plot and, and, and find the decision boundary using a contour plot. Um, Oh yeah, uh, but yeah, in this case, uh, uh, the way that we set it up is by using different levels here. So uh, essentially, um, um, the uh, margin should end up being at negative one and one on the decision function. So yeah, I can't remember exactly uh, uh, how that works. I think, I think this code kind of came from some examples from the textbook doing similar plots here to show the uh, decision boundaries. But, but essentially, uh, the, the margins are being estimated uh, as the, the places where we end up with negative one or one on the decision function um, that, uh, uh, that we apply here. So zero ends up being the boundary uh, in this case. Um, and then things above or below are going to be uh, uh, specified as one class or another in there. Right? But this gives you a little bit of visualization of, of what the um, uh, where the margin in the bean, right? Um, so you can see for this data set, we're only using the Virginica and the not Virginica. Um, um, so there was a lot of, of things that were kind of, uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't completely linearly separable in this case. Um, and you know, I would encourage you, we, we could try, I think there's some discussion in this notebook, but we could try to see what happened, you know, if, if we vary, especially like C in this case, um, um, uh, how it would affect the, uh, the decision boundary that's made um, on this data set. So like if we make it bigger, You'll notice that, uh, or maybe you don't remember exactly, but, but making it bigger, uh, we end up with uh, smaller margins in that case, so, uh, because we're doing less regularization uh, on the model there. So. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. So there's some examples then in this notebook of using uh, kernels to do some nonlinear models. Uh, so yeah, we're doing some, some the same stuff that we did before. So uh, example of, of just uh, doing it by hand. So by setting, uh, creating some polynomial features um, to get a nonlinear decision boundary. Um, um, and doing the same thing. So this should give us a pretty similar result. Um, but uh, 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 just using the built-in polynomial uh, kernel um, from uh, the support vector classifier. So again, uh, yeah, in this case, it might be better than the other notebook. I think we should get, I was trying to get exactly the same uh, model, uh, the same decision boundary that we had before, but in the first case, we're doing it by hand. Um, where in this case we're using a uh, 
the, the polynomial kernel, uh, calling that uh, for our support vector classifier instance that we make, uh, but with the same degree uh, and these other parameters would have to be the same in order to get the same result there. So yeah, it does does look like it these might be pretty close, if not the same, eh, maybe not quite exactly the same. So, um, Um, so uh, it's some more examples. Uh, you know, I'm trying to give you some intuition of what modifying, uh, especially the, the C parameter does. So on the first one that we did here, we had a, a relatively reasonable uh, version of C, well, um, uh, like five, so relatively kind of higher. Um, so you know, again, remember this is reversed. So if, if we make it smaller, uh, uh, we're going to try. This is like uh, try, this is like uh, uh, fighting uh, overfitting here. So this will tend to push it to be more linear. Uh, to try to find a simpler decision boundary instead of wiggling all around um, when we have low things to see, because that's that's allowing uh, a much more um, um, much more emphasis on the error term if we're if we're minimizing uh, the first term in the cost function. So let me see. So yeah, the result uh, for low C's is, is push it back to something more linear, right? Didn't, didn't work out very well on the example in the other uh, textbook, but, but here is kind of what you expect. The smaller C you get, the more uh, it'll end up trying to push it to something linear. Right? So but although in this case it's not, um, so, so here, oh, we are using some Moon's data set again here. Um, so yeah, the circles are the uh, the one class, the negative class, and the squares are the positive class here. Um, so this won't perform very well uh, in this case. So a lot of stuff is misperforming, so that's too much regularization in this case. Um, anyway. Now, going the other direction, so if, if we make C pretty big, uh, um, uh, will tend to, to be more wiggly, more overfitting. Um, so in this case, you, you get it. Uh, so the easiest way to see that is how much of a variation the margins have uh, uh, when we're potentially overfitting here. So. Um, okay. Uh, Oh, right. Um, so here was what I was talking about before. Uh, the, yeah, the textbook uses um, this form of the Gaussian function. Um, so uh, instead of using the sigma, uh, so dividing by like the sigma squared, it, it uses uh, the, the gamma uh, in the formula there. So that's, that's a gamma there. Um, so uh, Uh, but it has kind of the same effect, but just the inverse uh, as the sigma, like we talked about. Um, but this is this is what you need to use for the assignment four, since we are going to be using the radial basis functions from Scikit-Learn. It uses this form of uh, the equation, so it's just taking gamma t multiplied times um, the uh, the distance, basically there. So. Um, So like we were showing before, if we have a single feature, uh, the, um, uh, the blue one is using um, a smaller gamma. 
So since it's inverse, smaller, smaller gammas are like bigger sigmas, so you get more spread out. That's what the, the, the blue one ends up being here. Um, and the green one um, is using a bigger gamma, so you get mo a more tight similarity, a more spiked uh, kind of uh, thing on the similarity there. So, um, and uh, yeah, when you get to the assignment four, there's, uh, here's uh, another place where we, um, but you will need this. So, I mean, gamma uh, is just the inverse of sigma squared times two. So, 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 so yeah, just point out the gamma or the sigma squared from uh, the other notebook that we use for these radial basis functions. You get that formula. So, you know, um, if you want to have a radial basis function with a particular sigma, but you have to pass in the gamma parameter, you can just you can just plug it into this formula to figure out what gamma you need to use to get the equivalent sigma, or vice versa. So. But yeah, when you get to that uh, part of the assignment four, this will be useful. So we show both using um, uh, gamma uh, and then the equivalent um, uh, using uh, sigma. Um, down here. So. so in this case, on, on the first one, uh, da, 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 we used like a gamma of 5 and 0.1 uh, for the two different curves that we had here. Um, So it looks like uh, on this notebook, just uh, to let you know that um, I was expecting um, um, so if we wanted to compare these, we'd have to, to correctly uh, specify the uh, um, sigma for both of these. So like uh, this one using a sigma 5 from one of them. Um, uh, where, where our gamma was five before, uh, figuring out what the sigma is for that, um, and uh, 0.3 on this one. There we go. Hopefully that's the same one. So um, that's what we did before there. So I don't know why I didn't have that set on this one, but but anyway, uh, the the point is that you should be able to convert back and forth between those. Uh, when you need to for the assignment four. So. Um, oh, right. Uh, Um, this is a little bit more, you know, I, I, I hope from reading through these notebooks or the, uh, the textbook, you can kind of understand what's being done here. So, you know, uh, like I mentioned at the start of the class, the way I think about it is similar to what we did for the, the polynomial regression. So it's creating a new or a different set of features from the original features. So this is, this is kind of a good example though, of what the radio basis function or the similarity function does, right? So uh, if we have these, if we have just a single feature and these are our original locations of the feature, uh, we can create two different landmarks, uh, x2 and x3 here. So uh, we're, we're going to create two new features, we'll call them x2 and x3, uh, from the original feature that we have and we're just going to um, uh, transform these into two features, how similar they are to these two landmarks, right? So originally this data isn't uh, linearly separable, right? So we've only got one feature, but there's no place that we can put this that will give us a very good um, decision function if, if we need to use like a linear model, right? So anywhere you put this, we're gonna have a lot of stuff on the one side or the other that's wrong. I could put it here and get all these correct, get those two correct, but I'd have those two wrong. 
or vice versa, right? So if we define two uh, uh, kernels, uh, two landmarks, x2 and x3, this will just be the measure of the similarity uh, of all these points to x2, right? So uh, this one will be really similar to x2, it should be a 1, um, and, and these these here will be similar to x2, but on x3, they'll not be very similar. So they'll be closer to zero over here, right? Same for this. Like, like this one should be very, have a high x3, uh, but will be lower on x2, right? So um, uh, this is the mapping of that, right? So it doesn't always work this cleanly, but um, 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 uh, from that one feature, if we calculate the similarity for x2 and the similarity x3 and replot, uh, uh, those were the original points that we had before, uh, and these are now uh, in this example. This example is from the textbook, but these are now uh, linearly separable, um, and that's what you know the the what kernels do is similar to adding polynomial features. So now we've remapped this into a higher dimensional space, um, and um, um, the, we're going to have the possibility that it's going to be easier. Um, to find a decision boundary uh, in the space now. Um, so this is this was uh, just finishing up this example. We're showing fitting a linear uh, support vector uh, machine uh, to this data that we by hand put through the the, the Gaussian kernel here. So there's an uh, you know an easy decision boundary uh, now that separates them. So. All right. Um, and there are more examples uh, in the textbook and in this notebook of using radio basis function kernels. Uh, I think we've probably covered most of this stuff here. Um, uh, let me say one more thing. Um, uh, let me just skip down here to the talking about regression. So um, support vector machines uh, and logistic regression um, um, really work best, they're, they're, support vector machines are more natural for doing uh, classification for, uh, just because of the way that they're, uh, the, the cost function is formulated. But you can use support vector machines for regression, so the, the textbook talks a little bit about that. Uh, so if you're using scikit-learn, uh, instead of using SVC, you can use SVR. Um, so that does, uh, that, that makes the, necessary modifications to the cost function to make it work well uh, for regression problems uh, if you want to try and fit a support vector to a regression problem. Um, um, so yeah, the trick is to reverse the objective uh, if you're doing regression. So uh, I won't go into the details, but, but you're really modifying the cost function a little bit. Uh, if you want to use uh, the, the support vector and the kernel trick uh, to do regression problems. So, um, uh, so instead, we're, we're trying to fit the largest possible, um, uh, uh, so if we want to do regression, we want to try and create uh, the smallest possible margin that includes as many of the points as possible, right? So, so for classification, we wanted to create a margin, a margin that excluded all the points, or as most of the points as possible, and was as big as possible. So if we just reverse that idea, if we try to, to create a margin that has all the points in it, um, and, and get that margin as small as possible, that defines a good regression line, right? If we're just thinking about a, a linear, a fit in the line to the data. Um, so uh, for re because of the, the, the change in the cost function, uh, there's a, instead of the C, um, there's an epsilon parameter, uh, which you use to, to um, specify the amount of regularization that you want. Uh, so large epsilons give um, 
uh, larger streets, uh, so they end up being more underfit. Um, so so uh, using give you actually more uh, regularization and, and smaller epsilons. We'll try to make it smaller, uh, which might lead to overfitting. So. Um, So using that function that we did before, uh, but for a regression problem, um, so here the only difference that we did before is we're going to use a linear kernel, but we use the SBR, so we, so we tell it to uh, try and do it as a regression instead of a classification, uh, in this case, uh, for some particular value of epsilon. Right? Um, so yeah, this data set was what? Um, uh, we just generated some data at random uh, that was linear, um, that had a slope of 3, an intercept of 3.5, and we added some noise onto it. Right. So you'll see this. So you know, here, by plotting out the margins, you kind of maybe hopefully see what I was talking about. Uh, so what, we, what the, the modification to the cost function was to try to find a margin that was as small as possible that kept as many of the values as possible inside of the margin. And the result of that is going to be a regression, basically. Right? Um, and in this case, you know, since, since we asked for a linear model, uh, we end up with a, 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 a linear regression here. So the best fitting line uh, using the support vector machine cost function um, uh, in this case. So if you compared that to just fitting a linear regression, you'd probably find they're pretty similar in this case, um, 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 but, but it won't be exactly the same, right? So it is using a slightly different cost function in this case. So, um, So I guess the rest of this notebook is kind of showing what happens if you vary the, the, the epsilon. So if you make it smaller, uh, it will allow the margin to be bigger. Um, and then finally, the, the, the final example in this notebook, um, and you can use uh, a nonlinear kernel uh, to fit a regression, kind of same thing. So here, if we have some data, uh, that's a, what, a quadratic, so something to uh, a square power here. Um, uh, with some noise added into it. Um, we can fit like a polynomial kernel or we could probably use a radial basis function kernel. Um, so any of those nonlinear kernels uh, to fit a regression to the data. Oh, yeah, so here we show what the actual uh, regression model was, right, and, and we plot the raw data. So similar to what we were doing for the polynomial regression before, but using the, um, using the, uh, su uh, the support vector uh, machine, but for regression instead of classification here. But you can see it, it, it does pretty well, right, so this is the noisy data. Uh, and again, like if we created a degree two polynomial features, I would expect, uh, and, and use linear regression, I would expect that we get a pretty close, similar result, although not exactly the same, since we are using a slightly different cost function uh, in this case here. So. Um, okay, yep, so that's it for today. I think we've covered pretty much everything. Like I said, I'm sorry I don't have the assignment four up yet. It should be up today, uh, hopefully before I'm done for the day. So look at that. I would encourage you to get started on it, although, I don't think people will, will find it, they'll need as much time as, on this one as they did on number three, but still, uh, I'm still gonna try to keep next week, next Friday as the due date for that. So uh, look for that, let everybody, everybody else know, um, and, and at least um, um, accept it and get started on it this week or this weekend. So. All right, yeah, I'll let you guys go. Um, I'll hopefully see you guys, more of you guys next week uh, uh, when we get, talk about um, ensembles and stuff. <laughs>